The second industrial revolution is changing the face of Britain as ruthlessly as the first. Old mills, chimneys, even cooling towers, the familiar giants of the urban landscape are laid waste as industries die or modernize to survive. But muck and brass are united still in a new generation of entrepreneur. Well, I see our, our company and our group as industrialists. 95% of, of the people in Joe Public uh, seem to tag us on to ragmen, uh, the old barrow boys, but we're a far, far, far distance away from, from that. It's getting today that it's getting a, a really professional business uh, because we are being pushed to be professional. Four things push Graham Wilson to be more professional. The fearsome power of the technology, increased safety demands, public concern for the environment, and money. In Britain alone, there is now £1,800 million a year in recycling the materials the demolition man pulls down. Industrial ghosts halt the view from the M1 between Sheffield and Rotherham, where the mighty Hadfield steelworks once stood and thousands of men were noisily employed. Now the site is flattened, empty, windblown and silent. But Graham Wilson can't afford to be sentimental. The, the quoted old client of mine once said to me, well, you've done more damage to Sheffield than Hitler ever did. If we have to carry on doing demolition, and, and like a lot of people think we're doing a lot of damage, uh, as long as it, it pays the wages of men that feeds the families, does it matter? Beside the River Don, the greatest names in steelmaking and heavy engineering built their forges and foundries and rolling mills and meant them to last. The products they made went round the world, and they rewarded themselves with oak-panelled boardrooms and marbled halls. But they've gone. Demex, the company Graham Wilson runs, is one of the few places where anything at all is happening in an area raised to the ground by a recession. It isn't pretty or even very grand, sprawling over several acres a bare mile from the centre of Rotherham. But it isn't just destructive either. The steel that is still produced in South Yorkshire is made entirely from scrap. Whatever the shape or form, it has to be harvested, cut down, gathered up and sorted out. Graham Wilson's officers would have passed for a brick outhouse to the old ironmasters. There's no neoclassical facade, no uniform gatekeeper. But there are precious few yuppies in this hard grafting trade. He has no flash title, but Graham Wilson is unmistakably the boss, carrying the can to the board of his parent company, and at the sharp end. North Gorber, near Barnsley, is a colliery recently shut down, but with picking still to be had. All we really are is the uh, carrion crow following modernisation round. Well, some say the crow is the modern world's most highly developed bird. Has the man made his mind up where he wants the garbage? Yes, we take him on the top. You need a place? Oh, yeah. Yes, the uh, best of tea time, Teddy, next week, aren't you? 
Yes, if we get Ted here, we can get a lot of this stuff sorted out mm. and make steel mag out of it. The basis uh, of your labour force is that you have roughly 60 to 70 percent of your men that are regular family men. A lot of some of these men that have what he has been with me 10, 15, 16 years. Uh, you do have a, f a certain amount of floating people, which occasionally you have to uh, accommodate, build up, depending on the, the workload. Uh, the main thing what you've got to remember is that it's a every arduous job and none of them's Oxford undergraduates. And labour relations can be rough and ready. Disputes are likely to be sorted out, to put it politely, on a man-to-man -man basis. Man management is Graham Wilson's responsibility. So is negotiating the maze of finding available work if you're not on the right list of favoured names, bidding the right price for that work, coming out with a profit. Grimethorpe Colliery has been modernised and the obsolete plant is being scrapped. Touring the site with a coal board official, Graham Wilson relies on his eye, the experience and knowledge of the markets to work out the worth of the scrap he can get out, the cost of doing the job, and how much to offer the coal board if he's to make anything on it. That's an addition to the original. Yeah. I want to keep that. You can strip the inside, yeah. but the outside I'm going to use yeah. another colony for yeah. different purposes. Yeah. So, so what we actually do is go through the structure to get the, the bulk tonnage and then cross-reference uh, the machinery for the weight. But no matter how long you, you, you sit and you scratch your head and you, you work out, you'll use a box full of pencils and you get down to a situation where you've got to take the decision uh, after working out you might end up with 1800 tonne the first time, 1900 the second, 2000 the third, and you keep finding bits. So what you do is, you strike an happy medium. Uh, even as daft as, uh, to think about it, I've even argued with myself to make certain whether to get the job, even tossed a coin between two figures, what, what I've agreed to, based on, in my own mind, to put in for the job. Yes, yeah, so this, this, so, oh, so stripped out leaving this, because this will be continually running, to keep the plan. Right, yeah. So I yeah. have to make sure there's no interference whatsoever with the working plan. With the working of this new yeah. plant. If that goes down for an hour, it's, it's money through the window. We should be within a bid of between 60 and 70,000. On a job of this scale, you can be 300 tonne either way. Because there's large amounts of uh, values, odds, sods, uh, stanchion bases, what you cannot see at this minute in time. In the event, he bid a bit lower. A new company, eager to get its foot in the door, bid much higher, and he lost the job. As far as competitors are concerned, uh, we've got about, in this area, three which are very, very, very keen. We're up against them on a regular daily basis, where there used to be a bit of butter left on the bread. It doesn't exist today. We have to basically outperform one another to make the profits and, and to uh, keep the company in existence. And we are very happy if we can return, after all expenses, a 10% margin. The demolition man works in a business environment that shifts as fast as the landscape he changes. When Spain joined the common market, it fell into line with the Brussels policy on steel production. In other words, making less of it. One ready market for scrap fell right away. But for the time being, the electric art furnaces of South Yorkshire maintain their appetite. The framework and, and the steel construction, when we remove it, it, it is cut to either five foot material or two foot material. 
for consumption in local steelworks, either private or BSC. Rubble, we sell for secondary fill for builders, roads, all different types of coals and general fill material. And it helps to have a bit of the antique dealer in you, in an age when rapid change is accompanied by a deep nostalgia of the way things were. You don't break up the past, if you can sell it. The, the only thing, everybody's got the opinion, the only thing we do is make a load of muck, make a load of dust, aggravate people and bugger off. Behind me you can see a land that's been recovered uh, by firstly removing a big shale heap and secondly regrading and thirdly resoiling and now we've got it back to what it was maybe 100 years ago and the farmer can start cropping it. But reclaiming farmland isn't the image people want of the demolition man. Felling chimneys is more like it, bringing down the towers that have lauded it for generations over industrial Britain. In fact, Graham Wilson brings in outside explosive experts for stacks like this one at an old coalite plant. It's a very straightforward brick constructed stack, uh, 150, 160 foot high. As you can see, we've literally the final preparations prior to blowing. Steady up, Bobby. Uh, it's all out in three parts. She's, the stack is now stood on two stools, and them stools are roughly about 84 ounces of jelly in them. And we're hoping to blow at about five o'clock. I've got a bit of rope on his. Yeah, a, a bit of rope, I bet it's 25 goes with the rope waste. Right, 20, 30 ton of pit muck would just to be ideal. I don't know if we can scan something next door. Well, we've been involved over the years with stacks because on the larger jobs that are a common day situation. We're blasting this one. The, the old way was to open the front of the stack out, what we call gobbing out, and then we'd pack it with timber and fire it. So as the timber declined in strength by burning, and she stack came down, but this is more prompt and more safer in our mind. Bringing down chimneys usually is safe because the risks are obvious. It's the unconsidered that catches you out, like failing to check what a little pipe's connected to before you give it a yank. Things can go wrong. Not it's a chimney job, but all us remember one in Sheffield where clearing the site up, oh, next to another company, they found a little gas little gas pipe running outside of this four and a half inch wall. And the driver decided it was a bit above ground, so he grabs over it, pulls it, next door a chip shop, pull it for range through the wall. <laughs> Not funny to chip shop, man. Well, we had a very light fire which we wanted, so we got no scattering with the plant across being a bit delicate. And you could basically see as she came down, once she started to come, she grabbed the air inside her just before literally impacting and she just opens up and she just spreads. But we've got no overrun on distance at all. We've ample room to slot her in, but we've no overrun and that were the main thing. Chimneys are like children. Once damage is done, like you can't, you can't always put it back, can you? <laughs> Nobody ever bothers about something that goes right. You only make press if something goes wrong. As my dad used to say, today's news is tomorrow's arsewipe. 
but even today you can't because the print's not so good. <laughs> The natural enemy of the demolition man is the bureaucrat in Brussels, in London, or the nearest town hall. Safety rules, of course, have to be enforced. But Graham Wilson is more bewildered by a conservation lobby he thinks has missed the really good buildings and is now bent on looking after the second rate. He misses the fine Victorian chapel he flattened, but can't see the attraction of a half collapsed factory. I basically brought you here to introduce, to introduce you to my problem child, which is a a three-acre site that we purchased uh, as a natural extension to our business. The idea generally was to take down all the buildings, leaving an outer perimeter which we would smarten up to make it, make it acceptable. But once we got ownership and three parts of the work completed, we found out that a gentleman came along one day and slapped a notice on us and said that this area here is listed are going to be listed, we can't touch it, we can't do nothing with it. But bureaucrats and their laws only exist because somebody wanted them and wanted an end to the wholesale destruction of the environment. There's been need for restrictions and there's been need for guidance. Uh, they have more time to sit down and, and study a matter than what we have. But there is a one or two parts where they've gone totally overboard. One local authority man said to me a few weeks ago, uh, if you get any problems, come and talk to me. Well, after the best part of 30 years in the business, and the man that were talking to me was about 26 or 7, uh, I couldn't see where the man could offer me guidance. Yes, we've got to work together. Yes, we've got to perform together. But uh, I think it's got to be on a, a sensible relationship. Demex appealed against the preservation order and won. Carlisle Works is now just another gap in Sheffield's industrial East End. But who loves those plain and shabby workhorses, the early power stations? The building at Thornhill, near Dewsbury, has had no real money spent on it for 40 years. And the Victorians used the site on the banks of the Calder Canal to tip muck of all kinds, from the contents of earth closets to waste coal. Graham Wilson wanted it badly and was ready to pay. Well, in and around between three and 400,000. But uh, the easy, definitely the easiest job on this site was the fee for the solicitors, not for us. Thornhill was one that was in the pot and it was simmering. We managed to dodge in at the last minute. And Harold up there, we are banker's draft for 250,000 in my hand. I, I went up there with the basis of saying, well, here you are. Here's our first gambit. And if you turn up with a banker's draft of that value, they know that no bank's going to give you that unless you've got the collateral to, to back it up. The 400-foot chimney and power station itself were only the tip of what Graham Wilson saw in a wilderness covering 50 acres. He bought the lot, lock, stock and barrel, and set about recovering the riches of the country's least likely treasure trove. First, he picked over the rubbish. We then recover the material, put it through uh, a mini laundry, if you want to call it, from that handle, or we call it a barrel washer. And once the material's gone through the barrel washer, except for very uh, slightly minor adjustments required to it, what we've got is a, a very good quality fuel. We've got roughly uh, about five, six thousand ton, with about another six or seven thousand ton to come out and the, the recovered coal off the top will have had about 89,000 ton out already gone. It is anywhere between 15 and 30 pound a ton depending on the grade that we make it to. Which sounds like a reasonable return on fuel that's already been discarded once. What's left he'll treat and sell to put on your garden. But there's much, much more.
This material, what I'm shuffling about with my feet is riverbed sand and gravel. We originally came across it solely by accident. We came down here in the early stages uh, to evaluate the depth of coal. And just out of curiosity, we decided to overdig down to see what we got well below the coal. But we are hoping now to recover something like a million tonne of uh, sand and gravel, which after processing should make us between one and two pound a tonne clear profit. The smile doesn't have to end there either. Maybe he can sell the waterfront too. Well, in the very near future, when we've finished removing all the uh, valuable assets off the land, we intend to reclaim it all by tipping and, and landscaping the area. And we are in the mind of bringing vessels in here with sand, other sand and gravel from Newark area and unloading them at this wharf. And also, there is the possibility of possibly extending or, or doing some modifications to the area to make it to accommodate private and leisure vessels. And the final coup would be to sell the very hole in the ground, if they'll let him. This land's no good at all. It's just garbage. It's been half tipped, it's rough. But then you want to smarten it up, you want to do something with it. Hold on. You can't believe what you hear. The thing is today is that you can have some people with very, very, very great ideas and good ideas. And bureaucracy stops them. I think at the end of the day, this country's got to have one hell of a shekel. One hell of a shekel. If you look at it seriously, Napoleon once said, we're a, a country of shopkeepers, but good fighters when we get us back to the wall. I can't see how much nearer to the wall we can get. I've got the pointing imprints on my arse. What's rate on it? What would it be, Ray? Despite the new professionalism, there are still con men and cowboys in the demolition business. Here's a tip for hard-pressed industrialists. If somebody offers you cash to store unsaleable rubble in your empty warehouse, run a mile. We call it the Bratford trick, the Bratford stockpiling trick. It's, uh, it's created a lot of hassle up and down the country. It's, it's, a, it's a great con, really if you're not wanting to stop in business. Because you go along and you, you pick a contract up, maybe with 50, 60, 70,000 tonne of concrete and rubble that's not no use to anybody. And you go along and you find a man that's got possibly a big factory that's not doing anything at all. Preferably inside a big factory. And what happens is that they go along to the old boy that owns it, who's had a rough time and not making any money at all. And uh, they say, well, would like to use this to store this material and they find a local builder to fit, to fit the act as well nine times out of ten and they, they come along and they say well look we'll give you five or six thousand quid to store this material because this man wants it in three months time so what they do they fill the factory up completely with hardcore what they've no intentions of ship, ship, shipping out at all but the problem is when they've offered the man the five thousand pound, they've said to him, "Well, you don't want all this through the books, do you? What we'll do is we'll give you three on paper and two in cash. We can't go running nowhere because the next time he turns around and he's looking for the man to shift it, the man's gone. It's a brass plate job. What happens is that somebody buys a company for a hundred and fifty, two hundred pound, buys twenty pounds worth of stickers to stick on half a dozen wagons. That even money of the wagons don't even belong to the man anyway." And they do the job, and they're gone. And there you've got the man, he can't shout too loud, he can't jump up and down because A, he's got problems with the tax man, and B, is illegal tipped. So he ends, ends up either leaving it in there forever in a day, or going bust. Whether he's a spoiler, an opportunist, or a frustrated man of vision, the demolition man can only operate as the whole economy will let him. Graham Wilson would rather help an expanding firm to modernise because it's work that comes again and again. In a recession, somebody else's disaster may bring a handsome profit, but it's a profit that only comes once.
It looks like organised vandalism, but British Rail's advanced passenger train was scrapped before it ever went into regular service. Still, the APT experiment did provide technical knowledge now being put to good use in a happier story. The £300 million electrification of the East Coast Main Line between London and Edinburgh. And more than 100 bridges like this one at Ranskill between Retford and Doncaster are having to be replaced to make room for the overhead electric wires. It's a commando-style operation for Demex, the supreme test of speed, skill and muscle. A new bridge has been built and Wilson and his men have to remove the old one between the last train on Saturday night and the first on Sunday morning. That's ten hours flat, without harming an inch of the track. Well, basically we're at Bridge 308 and we're hoping to get part possession at roughly half ten, quarter to eleven, where we can lay half the carpet, which is a sleeper protection to the line, and then we have to ease off to something like half past eleven. Everything is right and there's no delays. Really, we want to be away from here, cleaned up and done on the bridge. A bit of luck. Half six, pessimistic. Half past seven if we've got a bit, a bit more cleaning up than, than usual. On a job like this, Wilson takes instructions from the site manager of the main contractor. The far side now. We've got the far side now. Yeah, and that one, we're waiting for one train. Now Derek's down on the track level. How long will that be? About 10 minutes. It's just leaving Bolter yeah. in here. Right, we'll wait while he comes through. And what happens if they fail? I don't think they'd be kind words. You could take that just as kind words being in money. I think we'd be about as uh, acceptable as Mixima's daughters in a rabbit farm. If you're working for a client, he wants you there. And if the client knows that you've gone out to put yourself out to make certain that the job's doing right, without any pain, anger or problems, he wants you back. Everybody, even even to my contracted employment, whatever they put in front of my name is and other duties. And that's for everybody on this firm. When I sweep the bugs out, we all sweep the bugs out. That's how we survive. Just as well, perhaps, that he's a self-confessed workaholic, whose idea of a day out is to take his wife and kids to look at a demolition site. The final go-ahead for the destruction of Bridge 308 comes from the British Rail site manager. All right, Graham, I think the mat is okay now, so I think you can start that model. Thank you very much. Okay. First to go are the parapets, not cleanly inwards and therefore away from the track. Handling the brute power of the machinery demands massive concentration and skill. The machine drivers today, uh, as somebody once we had a difference of opinion with, he's got a driver on a machine he paid about £75,000 for that was rough. And I said, well, he said, well, it's all right. He'll, he'll not arm it. It's a good tool. And I said, well, would you buy a Rolls-Royce Camargue and put a mug to drive it? He said, no. I said, well, there's no difference. No difference in any shape or form because all you're doing is investing money for somebody to rack it to death. So it's your knife and fork of industry, isn't it? The lad who drives my big back actor, he's worked with me about 16 years. We might have a bad word now and again, a difference of opinion. Uh, I think it pays. It pays for him to call it, me to call him a pillar, and him to call me a pillar. I don't like a man that doesn't have a good back. I like genuine blokes that's got an argument that's constructive. 
With the bridge quickly reduced to its basic arch, another tool is brought in, called a henpecker. It probes and prizes the brickwork away so that it falls in manageable chunks onto the protective timbers covering the track below. When the arch itself is ready to go, there's nothing to prevent the machine falling into the cutting too. The trick is to bring it down under control so it comes to rest on its spike without toppling. If you watch the driver, he kept edging, edging back all the time. He could see it was spongy. The arch piece goes down. If you watch the man, he just put the, his, his braking tool straight in front of him and just come down on the sand. But when he slides down, it seems as though uh, he's a bit like an IOI act. But this lad here is an a experienced lad, and it's, that's why he, he does all the headache work. But the headache work has taken almost till dawn. We're as near to time as humanly possible. It's now four o'clock. Worst comes to worst, we should have got the feathers pulled off it for about half past seven, quarter to eight. Maybe have a little, give ourselves half an hour then to do a bit of titivation and a bit of cleaning up. But there's no margin for error with a train due in four hours and then a day of passenger traffic on one of the busiest lines in Britain. And there are no shortcuts for the workforce, just the long slog shoveling away crumbled bricks and mortar through the early hours. And it takes longer than expected, this sweaty labour deep in the heart of the Nottinghamshire countryside. The critical moment is not when the last of the rubble is gone, but when the protective sleepers have been lifted, and then the heavy polythene sheeting. The tiniest buckling of the steel could mean catastrophe. By eight o'clock, Graham Wilson is waiting for the train with all the anticipation of the early morning commuter. No time for titivation at all, and some of the timbers are splintered and broken, but the rails are unharmed. It's a bit like an expectant mother, is it coming or is it not? <laughs> we just got through when about five minutes to spare. A near thing, but the job's done. So what will Graham Wilson do with what's left of his Sunday? Oh, we're going to get tidied up. Pick all the odds and sods up. Go home and go and have a good bath. Have a bit of dinner with my sis and then we're going up to Jewsbury. Be in, bed, be in bed for about, about nine o'clock, as that old girl says, tuk tuk at tension. <laughs> it's a free booting sort of life, turning a penny or two where you can, looking after your own, and not caring too much what people think of you. Maybe the demolition man isn't so very different from those rough and energetic magnets who built the industrial Britain he's now busy knocking down. <laughs>